Welcome to my home. Um, so I was gonna do the uh the this is AMA too, right? Uh and it's, uh, some good questions have um have uh been amassed on the previous video, the AMA one video comments. If you got if you guys want this format to continue, you know, we could plan on doing it every Friday. Um, but if uh you know, if we don't get enough questions, then so be it. You know, it's no big deal. We're... Uh, okay, I'm going to start with the big one. This is... Uh, uh, Bobby Culpepper says, What's the trick to playing over non-diatonic chord progressions? This is, this is huge, because as a uh, young musician uh, who was essentially a rock player going to jazz school, that was a huge... A huge part of learning to you know of learning to play jazz and why i was never a great jazz player while in school in the years after school i really reflected a lot on okay how should they have taught a native rock player or somebody who um you know how, how do you teach a rock player to to play jazz or at least to nail the changes part and here here's here's what you do you need to you need to make it to where that certain things certain synapses fire in your brain habitually automatically when uh when faced with a given thing so let's say i'm in a five fret area right got a five fret area the goal is i need to be able to nail i need to be able to play through any changes uh without moving vertically any changes to any song i need to be able to play in one area right i should be able to play it comping, you know, playing the chords, or I should be able to improvise through through any changes without moving. So if I can do it there, and maybe I can do it here or here, then I can do it everywhere. And I can move later, you know, if I decide I want to move around, so be it. But I need to be able to not move around, right? Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> you, the idea is you make it to where this process is automatic because you've drilled it so many times, right? Uh, you here? Let me pull up a pull up a song. Uh, what's uh, 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 "Falling Grace"? I'm gonna look at "Falling Grace," one of my uh, one of my favorite tunes ever. Um, okay, so I actually know the changes, but I got them here. All right, so I'm in an area, right? Five fret area. First chord is A flat. Very first thing is you'll notice this is gonna sound somewhat familiar, except based on note names. Very first thing that happens in my brain is where's my root on one of these bottom three strings? A flat, there it is. Second thing that fires is what's the cage shape? Boom. We're talking about major or major seven, whatever whatever variant I want to do. But I play a shape that I know the notes in, right? So this is third, fifth, uh, third root, fifth, seven, or, or if I'm just thinking straight up the triad, you know. I'm not going to play this, but I'm going to see it. So where's my root? Bam. What cage shape? Bam. I haven't played a thing yet. This happens very, very fast anyway, especially the more you work on. Um, so, uh, but I start by playing a chord tone, right? And from this chord, chord tone, which I know is a five, I can derive that here's a four and a three, right? Now I'm moving on to a next string. I know there's a root and therefore that's a seven and two, right? Actually, this would probably be a sharp 11. Now, I'm playing notes as I figure them out, and I may move on to another string where I know there's a root and a 7, and therefore that's a 6. Now, what's happening here is I'm starting to notice, well, wait a second, this, this has to be this scale shape that I already know. The difference is now I see the entire scale shape, but I see them as big dots and small dots. The big dots are the chord tones. The small dots are the twos, fours, and sixes. And that is what will help your lines sound even more jazzy, is that you're able to gravitate toward chord tones in the, in the line. So, so, again, I see a change, right? Here's a D7, right? Where's my root? Bam. What chord shape? Bam. I start playing notes in the chord shape. And deriving this two from from the fact that this is a three, and this four from the fact that this is a three. Here's a root that that's a flat seven and six. Five, I know that's a five. Therefore, that's a flat. Uh, that's a six and a flat seven. 
and pretty soon I notice I'm dealing with that that uh, that that scale shape that I already know, but now I see these notes as more important than all the notes. So if you're just looking at it as as a scale shape, as a uh, scale shape where all the notes are undifferentiated, you know, if 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 someone says, "Look, this A flat major seven, it's really from this this C minor scale." If you just approach it like, "Oh, that's the C minor scale," you're actually going to have a harder time sounding like. So at least like a jazz player or like a country player, by the way. Same same basic idea. You need to be able to gravitate toward the chord tones. So, on a... a and now here's G minor. I know this because five, like five, one, flat three, two. I'm, I'm figuring it out as I'm as I'm playing it. But notice I've already started with chord tones, right? I'm playing the notes I've already figured out. And I, I'm essentially getting to the non-chord tones. But that that starting with chord tones is a great approach because it it that is the traditionally the purview the the uh, of a jazz player is that they're they're they gravitate toward the chord tones. But like I said, the same thing is true in country, you know? I mean I mean if if we're playing over uh, uh, I'm, this is like I'm thinking of B flat seven this whole time. And what's making the line sound a certain way is the fact that like this and this are stopping points, but these aren't, right? I get through these to get to this, right? Now to E flat seven. I suck at this today, uh, just like getting cool lines going, but anyway, but uh, that's that's the idea, right? You're gravitating toward chord tones. So the way you get to where you can play over changes is you make it, to, you see a change. Where's my root? What shape? Whichever shape. And you start playing with that shape and deriving other non-chord tones from it, the twos, fours, and sixes from it. All the time you're playing, right? And that, And then that's it. Right. The the benefit is you're seeing some notes as more important than other notes, which is exactly what you need in order to play idiomatically jazzy or countryly. Jazzily or countryly. Very uncommon adverbs, but um all right. So but yeah, and, and that becomes a habit like anything, you know? Like just immediately you see a change. It, you get it to where your brain just goes, where's the root? There, or, there's the root, there's the shape, and you're already playing. And it, it gets to where it happens extremely fast. Clayton asks, if we're playing, uh, this is a great question, if we're playing a uh, playing slash chords, for example, an A minor over G, right? Um, I have a, I have treble bleeds in this. I, I have all sorts of uh, heresy in my Gibson style stuff. My, uh, my SG is one volume, one tone. I don't use the tone. One volume, one tone with a treble bleed in it. And it's the way I like it. It's perfect. And this one, uh, I, I'm down to, I've got two volumes, two tones, but both on, with treble bleeds. It behaves a bit strangely, um, but it also, I'm way more likely to actually use the volume knobs. Um, anyway, um, if we're playing A minor over G, is it, do we need to call this A minor 7 over G? Because with the G, it would be A minor 7, right? So the G would be the flat 7 of an A minor chord. So do we include the the, the bass note in the name? That's the, that's the question he's asking. Do we include the bass note in the name of the chord? And I would say it it you could go either way. This This could be either called A minor over G or A minor 7 over G. I think A minor over G is more likely to get you uh, a uh, is more likely to get you a uh, uh, the sound if you if this is the sound you want you know if you want definitely the triad on top 
and and only, and only that flat seven on bottom, as opposed to people playing minor sevens on top. If that's the sound you want, then you should you, then calling it A minor over G makes it more likely that you'll get that sound. But technically, either name is perfectly fine. Um, I run into this. Uh, my friend Noel and I have had this discussion before. Uh, I I like I like writing with that shape a lot. So it's like A sus two over C sharp. You'll notice that C sharp is the third. And remember, what sus means is that it doesn't have a two. I mean, it doesn't have a third. So if we include C sharp in the in the chord in the name of the chord, then this by no means is an A sus two. This is an A add nine. C sharp because it's got root two three five right a a add nine that makes it a major nine right but really what I want is I I don't want I only want the three in the bass note that's the thing I want so if I say a sus two over C sharp it's more likely that the musicians in the band are going to play the sound that I want so so if I don't care about whether C sharps are are up high then uh, then you know, yeah. So I would say, uh, really hardcore theory people are gonna want the the language to be respected, and and you know that they would say, yeah, you can't call that a sus two because it has a C sharp in it, even though it's in the bass. And uh, I'm not trying to be a hardcore theory person and try to make the language exhaustively descriptive right and and work in every possible case i don't care about the language what i care about as a writer is the sounds that i'm hearing and if I, and the fact that i can say a sus2 over c sharp and always get what i want that means i'm going to use that word that's what language is supposed to be anyway you do have to have proper language rules you know uh any society would have to has to be able to write laws right and those laws can't be subject to uh completely postmodern interpretation right there it has to be language rules where someone can say yes this when we say the speed limit is 65 that means that we all we all understand what that sentence means uh uh or contracts you have to be able to make contracts anyway so all right so oh jan or jan uh, ask uh, because I'm 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 all about teaching people to think rhythms when they're improvising. Uh, that's on uh, since I'm invisible one. Um, and uh, he's saying, what about learning to play drums or or uh, or pad and learning to make beats and stuff? And I would say most of what drummers do is to think uh, essentially polyrhythmically, right? You're teaching your foot to do one rhythm, your right hand to do one rhythm, your left hand to do a different rhythm, and to put those together. And I don't think that has a ton of application to what we're talking about, which is making very interesting single note rhythms, right? Um, that are not, it's not multiple rhythms uh, at the same time. Um, and, and so I would say, you know, yeah, learning to be a good drummer, I would assume is a very good musical uh, a very good decision for your musicianship anyway, but it, it doesn't really apply to what I'm talking about. Um, a better approach, I think, would be if, if really the issue here, I think, that you're asking about is uh, the programming in of new rhythms, right? Of, of, com of programming rhythms that would occur to you while you're playing a solo. And I think for that, I mean, a, a great approach would be to turn on solos of especially great jazz improvisers um um I, you know because of his tendency to play over the time uh i would actually st stay away from a lot of coltrane stuff you know a lot of his stuff isn't like that but uh and you might you might like that sound and sure go for it but uh, I think what we're talking about is locking into the time and playing interesting rhythms with that. When you're just blurring over the time feel, you know, and not bothering to do any discernible time, uh, any discernible uh, uh, subdivisions, then it's hard to make the rhythms latch onable, right? And I think what's what's interesting about Coltrane in those situations is that he's making an abstract painting out of a bunch of notes. You know what I mean? Um, and 
So it's more like this sort of meta idea. Anyway, so, uh, but, but yeah, like for me, I remember this, uh, this Chris, I think I may have mentioned it, this Chris Potter, uh, this album that Chris Potter was on and singing along with, with his solos and, and the insane solos. It was the, it's the live Dave Holland quintet album. So singing along with his solos and just that's programming new rhythmic, uh, material and the another thing though is and uh program in triplets most people never have triplets in their playing so like let's say uh let's say probably bad at it there but um microscopically early all right so most people all their subdivisions are so are basically quarter notes ba based on quarter notes or right or, or eighth notes or sixteen notes Right. They, all of that is very based on quarters, eighths, sixteenths, right? Everything is is divisible by a sixteenth note. But triplets won't naturally occur to you unless you spend some time programming them in. So trip, eighth note triples. Right? So the triplets are, they're not just groups of three. People who don't, uh, people new to triplets will tend to do things like, you know, Thing is, that's two sixteenth notes and an eighth note. Um, what we're talking about is three equidistant notes where two used to go. So eighth note triplets would be where two eighth notes used to go. There's three equidistant notes. So instead of quarter note triplets are where uh uh there's two quarter notes quarter 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 ba uh 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 one, two, three, one, two, three. There's eighth note triplets. The uh, eighth note triplets are exactly twice the speed of quarter note triplets. You can actually, you know, so like, so quarter, quarter, quarter note triplets, eighth note triplets. So you can go back and forth between like, like, uh, right. Uh, 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 uh. That's what like quarter note triplets, but I'm turning every other one into the eighth note triplets. So anyway, get triplets in your rhythmic vocabulary because they won't just magically appear. You got to sit down and work on them. And then all of a sudden it's like, it's like think of all the rhythms that you can build that, that could occur to you before like think of all the things you could build if you if you had a ton of each one but you had like three different shapes of lego block right if but you had a million of each shape right but you, there are only three different shapes you could build a zillion things with only three different lego block shapes but then somebody brings over a thousand of uh, each of two new lego shapes right all of a sudden the number of things you can build goes up exponentially it doesn't just go up by the number that you added it's 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 an exponential type of growth so uh triplets and their various varieties are brand new lego blocks they're 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 not really reducible to those other uh, to those other subdivisions you should try to work them in because the number of rhythms that you can come up with goes up uh, you know by the, an extremely large uh measure um mabakar asks what's my take on voice leading um this one's interesting and i did ask for some clarification uh, you know so voice leading if if you're new to the term it's essentially that the notes within your chord have a certain uh pleasing melodic uh 
aspect to them. Like as you're going between chords. Like, uh, notice a sort of melody emerges, especially on, on the top right, from my chord voicings. Whereas I might go, uh, uh, or maybe, let's say I go, you know, like, and there's, and there's like a disjunctness to it. Um, think, uh, it's just people, uh, mm. anyway, I'll, I'll quit, uh, trying to define it, but, um, basically I, slightly think of such things it's mainly I, I might be considering the the top note you know and keeping a uh like i might be thinking what we were presumably we're talking about while a song is going on while a melody's going on and i might be paying a little bit of extra attention to the top note but i'm not trying to generate a melody that competes with the main melody that's that's one of the most important things of of doing guitar in a in a way that honors the song is that you're not competing with the main line there's this old saying you know when one line is in motion the other lines should be at rest and that's a pretty good general uh stance to take doesn't mean you won't come up with cool counter examples but it means in general um you want to uh you know not make melodic content or something that's m melodic in such a way that that it's going to compete with the main melody. So typically, if I'm doing uh, some sort of uh, counter melody, it's going to be in when there's spaces in the melody. Um, other than that, though, uh, I would say what what probably comes across like uh, like voice leading for me is uh, trying uh, what what I try to do is maintain uh, probably more than most players i'm way into maintaining common tones between chords so like let's say four uh, so, so four to six right five i might play my five like that uh like like i'm thinking about that that top note and maybe retaining it into the next chord or moving it as little as possible so things like that i'm way into you know, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five. Maybe keeping a top note. That's that's gonna be overdoing it, but um, yeah, some attention paid to the top note. But I don't know if it's way way up my uh, unless I'm playing solo. It's that's not necessarily way way up my priorities list if I'm playing in a song. So um, yeah, if you got questions for next week. Let me know this. Uh, the I, I do think the big one from this week was, uh, you know, was Bobby Culpepper's question about how to play over changes. If you'll practice that, you'll get it. You know, that really is the, the way that rock players can learn to play jazz. The rock players can learn to play country. Because you notice rock and blues players can't really play either one. And yet country players can play jazz or blues and rock right and it's because they it's because they sh at least and, and like or or they can play bluegrass right bluegrass country and jazz share a certain respect for chord tones while improvising that rock and blues players tend to not bother with and uh yeah some blues players but especially the more jazz influenced ones will while they're playing blues they'll be targeting chord tones but Anyway, yeah, the end. Bye.